So before you attempt to pursue your astrophotography quest, ask yourself the following questions. Am I a planetary, deep sky, or a bit of both worlds type of astrophotographer? Now let's look at the type of gear that you have. So do you have a telescope that has a long focal length or a telescope that has a large F-ratio? So this will dictate the path you will likely take when it comes to your choice of astronomy cameras, as well as some other important factors that I will cover later in this video. Hi there, it's Gerald from Optics Central. Today I'll cover the two types of cameras that you'll find suitable for astrophotography. Planetary and deep sky cameras. The astronomy cameras used exclusively these days are CMOS cameras. And these are the cameras I will be covering in this video. There are two types of photographer who will be imaging the night sky. The first type of person with a fast F-ratio telescopes like the Rasa 8 or the Skywatcher Quattro. These are the photographers who you'll generally go for deep space. You see, deep sky objects can be very faint. So we need the ability to gather a lot of light into the telescope to enable us to capture the incredible detail in things like nebulae. Now, the other type of photographer who will be imaging planets They'll be using a slower F-ratio telescope, something like an F10 with a long focal length. Say, for example, a Celestron Edge 1100. Now, these telescopes have a focal length of 2,800 millimeters, and that size, this will give them good magnification. Slow F-ratio telescopes in planetary photography will give you good contrast and definition on bright planets. And as a side note, imaging with a faster F-ratio telescope, it's, it is possible, but you'll find the focal lengths are not as long, and because planets are relatively bright, the resulting images will be smaller, and you'll lose contrast and detail in your image. Now that we've covered the different types of telescopes that each photographer has, let's move on to the various types of cameras that are suited to each of these telescopes. Now, firstly, we'll have the planetary cameras. Now, these are quite easy to identify, usually smaller in size and commonly referred to as uncooled cameras. Though, we'll most likely have a small sensor and these cameras will always have a high frame rate. Cameras with high frame rates are needed in planetary imaging because you will use the video capability of the camera. One minute worth of video is usually is all that is needed to capture enough data. Let's look at this example. When you are looking through your telescope at a distant planet in the night sky, you are looking through Earth's turbulent atmosphere. It's like looking at an object from the bottom of a swimming pool. The object you are looking at from the floor of the deep pool will appear to wobble about. Earth's atmosphere is very much like this crude example. So if you were to take a single image of planets, the chances of getting a sharp image would be virtually impossible. This is where capturing a video of one minute and usually high frame rates come into play. A planetary camera with a frame rate of say 150 frames a second, like the ASI 224MC camera, uh, will allow you to take 9,000 frames. Now, with this amount of frames captured, you are bound to have captured some decent images. Put those images into stacking software such as um, PIP. The software will grade the images and rate them, keeping the good quality images aside. And with the blurry shots, it will put those aside. 
so you'll only be left with enough frames to stack and auto align. Stacking software such as Auto Stack It will stack these images. Now, by stacking your images, you'll get a very sharp image. Further processing to bring out the details is now required. And this is where you can use something like Registacks and the Wavelet function within that app to pull out details in planets like Jupiter, where you can see things like the great red spot appear or the turbulent cloud bands that encompass Jupiter. Further enhancements in something like Photoshop if you desire to do that. Now we'll move on to deep sky imaging. And this is a very different approach to capturing your targets. This time we are after a much larger sensor and a built-in cooler that will send the temperature to sub-zero temperatures. Most deep sky cameras can send temperatures down to around minus 35 to 40 degrees below ambient. Now, the reason why you want to do this is by sending the temperature to such cold temperatures, you are virtually eliminating that noise that an uncooled camera will naturally give you. Now, let's step back here. If you used an uncooled camera or even a DSLR camera on uh, a deep sky object, you will find that you are contending with a sensor that will most likely heat up due to the long exposure time required. And the heat on the sensor will mean you'll get severe noise. Now to add to that, if you were to use a DSLR camera, the chances are you'll be using uh, an ISO that is relatively high. For example, an ISO of around 1600. This in itself will create another type of noise. So a warm sensor plus the noise generated by high ISO is going to give you a result that will produce strange artifacts in the image that most post-processing will be difficult to remove. Sure, we can get ourselves a variety of plugins that remove the noise such as Topaz Denoise, but this will never be comparable with the image that has been taken with a fully fledged cool camera that is designed to eliminate noise and give you quality results. Images taken with a cooled camera will of course still need to be stacked. Remember, it's all about the amount of data you're prepared to take. You know, it's not uncommon to have an image that has a, a total capture of you know, 20 hours. You see, this is where you are capable of doing that with a, a cool camera. You know, try doing this with an uncooled camera and there's every chance a sense of temperature will be too hot for the camera to work and it will most likely just shut down after a few minutes. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the color versus mono. Don't be fooled by thinking a color camera is going to give you a better result. Of course, you can get a wonderful results with a color camera, or as it's referred to in astronomy terms as a, an OSC. However, by using a mono camera, you'll have the ability to capture much more image detail due to the specifications of the mono camera that you'll have chosen. You see, the main difference between the one-shot color and the mono camera is the ability to fill the well depth of the pixels. Think of each pixel being a deep well. A color camera will partially fill each RGB pixel at random, never filling up the well depth. However, with a mono camera, it will fill those wells to 100%. So in order for you to obtain color from a mono cameras, you're going to need four filters, luminance, red, green, and blue filters. Now these filters are placed in a filter wheel to create a color image in post-processing. The image quality of a cooled mono camera is superior to that taken on a one-shot color. Now we can get even more complicated if you want. All deep sky objects produce hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and a concoction of other element emissions. These are commonly called narrowband. So in order for us to see these emissions and use those in our images, we need to look at the narrowband filters. The filters we use are HA, O3, and S2 types of filters. Sometimes a combination of these, including uh, RGB, is what some photographers like to use. All this data capture can be very time consuming. 
because you will have to allow for seven times the time to capture your data. That's if you're going for colour and narrowband together. For example, two hours in each channel can end up leading to approximately 14 hours worth of imaging, and that's on one image. You'll never get the amount of time to image in one night. So an accurate computer mount is required to resume and continue your imaging run time and time again. Now here are some examples of work by various people, including myself, of objects taken when, with one-shot colours and mono cameras. So in summary, if you have time in your hands, go with a mono camera. On the other hand, if you're working full-time like me and have a limited time image in the night sky, the one-shot colour is the second close best. These days, one-shot colour allows you to use filters like the Optolong range of light pollution narrowband filters, especially designed for one-shot colour. And with one of these filters, you're no longer limited into whether the moon is up or not. So we're going to do a live image demo. Previously, I've gone through the process of opening the AVI file that the PIP produced. It took the good frames from the bad frames and left me with an AVI file of around 1800 frames. I'll now open uh, AutoStack 3 in this case. So we'll open the AVI file of ours because it's an entire planet I'm stacking. I need to tick on the, the planet box, leave the rest of the options as they are and hit the analysis button that will now go through the process of stacking. With the stacked output file it has generated, I will now go into Registax to align and look at the wavelets and the histogram to bring out the detail. The deep sky objects here are a stack of 20 photographs of 60 seconds each. As you can see, I am tinkering with the settings and levels and curves to bring out the detail. Remember, it's all about the more data you can capture, the better the quality of the final image. After some adjustments of levels, masking and some colour balance, the final images have the contrast, colour and clarity that I am very happy with. Optic Central have a range of deep sky, planetary and auto guiding cameras for you to consider. Look at the specifications of each camera to see if the camera you wish to purchase suits you. I have attached the PDF file of ZW range in the description below. So consider subscribing to our YouTube channel for more content coming your way soon. And from all of us at Optic Central, we wish you clear skies, a look up and see the wonders of our universe. of astronomy cameras, as well as some other important factors that I will cover later in this video. Roll on the intro.